the brands that have picked up these little pieces of the pieces of code and dusted them off and made them obvious, then it makes it easy for us to discern whether we want to be a part of that or don't want to be a part of that. Yeah, the part that resonates with me as you go through that description is when you're standing outside the campfire, you're waiting, you stand there and wait until you are welcomed in. And when if you are inside the circle, already around the campfire, if someone comes in without waiting or just comes flying in there, everyone's uncomfortable. messed up. Yeah, uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the ROI Online Podcast, where we believe you, the courageous entrepreneurs of our day, are the invisible heroes of our economy. You not only improve our world with your ideas, your grit, and your passion, but you make our world better. I'm Steve Brown, and this is the place where we have great conversations with winners just like you, while we laugh and learn together. Today, I'm really excited to have this conversation with uh, Patrick Hanlon, my friend, Patrick Hanlon. He's the author of Primal Branding, and it's an excellent book that I discovered one day, and I read it. Actually, I listened to it. Here's where I was. I was on Interstate 40 in my truck, my pickup truck, and I had my Harley-Davidson Road King in the back of the truck and I was taking it all the way to Kentucky to a friend of mine who owned a Harley Davidson dealership to let him sell it for me. I was sending my motorcycle, her name is Rosanante, and I had hung up my shaps as far as the motorcycling career, I can say that. And so I was listening to this audible book called Primal Branding. And the more I listened to it, the more excited I got because it was really connecting with me. Long story short, I reached out to Patrick. He came here. We worked with the team a little bit and started to apply thoughts and the processes from Primal Branding and became friends. And so, Patrick, I'm just pleased to have you here. Thanks. I forgot that you were on that road trip. I know that you told me that, but I had, it didn't stick in my brain, but that's awesome, actually. Yeah. Here I am riding across the Mississippi River, riding. I was driving, going into Memphis, and was going to eat some barbecue there at Rendezvous, one of the, the most famous places to eat some barbecue, listening to Primal Branding on Audible. Amazing. So those those I of you see you doing it. Yeah, I was doing it. I was <laughs> hardcore. So for those of you who don't know Patrick Hanlon, I do talk about Patrick Hanlon, Hanlon in my book. It's in the most important chapter, the chapter on content and introduce as many folks as I can to your book, but I discussed it in there. Patrick is His book is one of the most original books of its kind ever written. Patrick Hanlon explains how the most powerful brands create a community of believers around a brand, revealing the seven components that will help every company and marketer capture the public imagination and seize a bigger slice of the pie. Patrick works with uh, big Bands like the Glenn Miller Band and Desi Art. No, I'm just joking. He <laughs> works with big brands like Google, YouTube, Mini Cooper, and Oprah. You can find Patrick sometimes. You might bump into him in LA, San Francisco, New York, maybe a Walmart or two. And if he's ever in town, you might find him as uh, digging through an antique shop looking for old guitars. Welcome, Patrick. I appreciate you. Thanks, Steve. So what do you want to talk about? Well, I want to... The book is required reading at YouTube. I should probably uh, not bury the headline and say that we're coming out with a new... We have come out with Simon & Schuster agreed to put a new cover on the book after 16, 17 years. Can you believe it? That's a long time. That so the space alien it will be gone. It's uh, the new covers on the Kindle version right now, and then it will be on the printed books when, whenever that happens soon. So I'm looking at this new cover. It shows um, 
Mick Jagger's lips, but open. <laughs> okay. And it says, create belief systems that attract communities. Patrick Hanlon. It's got a unique look to it. And as one might know, that's what you get when Patrick's around, a unique look and personality. So 16 years, Patrick. It has a mouth and an t- open mouth, uh, as in word of mouth. It, it, not really Mick Jagger thing. I know. It's, we didn't it's... even think about that until just now. <laughs> the, uh, and then on the back, there are um, a bunch of words, and they're all, they've all been taken from social media comments over the years Yeah, and reviews. So, so this is something, what I love about your book and what I'm, what's, What's important for for me is that things that I adopt or want to apply, they need to have a perennial nature to it or a universal principle that will always be applicable no matter the time, whether it's in the future or in the past or now. And that's what I really love about your book. You know, I'm I'm curious. At some point, you had this epiphany where this kind of revealed itself to you is probably there all along, but one day it just really revealed itself. Talk to us about, about that day. Yeah. Well, um, I want to respond to something you just said though, first, and that is that, yeah, we got very lucky with the um, examples that I chose, which still are, are are still around most of them. And the, um, and the, the thing about the construct, primal construct, is that it, it's, it was as true 4,000 years ago as it will be 4,000 years from now. And uh, it's basically, it's based upon human uh, behaviors and um, rationale and emotional stuff. And in the book, there are things like the TED Conference, <laughs> which I talk about. Uh, Shepherd Fairy, Wired Magazine, and a bunch of other things that still, Apple, uh, other things that still exist today. And they're just as relevant now as they were then, uh, which I guess in some ways just occurred to me, kind of proves that out. But I, I, you know, we've talked about this before, Steve, and there are three kinds of people that write books. There are um, people who are professors uh, in the academy who need to write in order to keep their jobs there are journalists who also need to write about things. But then there are practitioners like you and me, and we don't necessarily need to write a book, but like you, I found this gap out there in the world and, um, and just and thought, Hey, there's a better way of doing this or there, at least a different way of doing this. I thought at the time. And in my case, I was working on a project, a client, project and I just felt that they were being disingenuous, um, a little bit fake, a little bit um, uh, artificial. Uh, Today we would say that they were being not being authentic to themselves and but we didn't articulate that as being authentic you know back in 1999, 2000, 2001 and so the client at the time was Lego and uh, I was working on, I was one of the, I was in advertising and I was working on as one of the executive creative directors on Lego. I, I assume that there are probably other ones because there are also other agencies at the time. And, um, but I was going back and forth between Billund and New York City. Billund is where Lego uh, headquarters is in Denmark, out in the middle of nowhere. And um, between there and New York City. And then I was also going to the Lego land in um, Carlsbad, out in California, north of San Diego. And um, that's when I learned that you could buy a Mighty Mouse roller coaster and put whatever kind of shell you want on it. You could put a Steve Brown (laughs) shell on there and uh, ROI online shell on there, and you could have your own own roller coaster ride, you know? And that's what Lego is doing. They were taking off-the-shelf elements and putting them on. Uh, Whereas in the Legoland, at the Legoland in Billund at headquarters that had been done by the grandfather and it was like Walt, he was there, Walt Disney. And it was very, um, there was heart heart and soul there. Right. And so, so to make a long story short, the, uh, that is exactly, that was a feeling that I had. It was exactly 
the same time that a um, McKinsey consultant was working with them. And he told the family that if they continued on the way they were going, they'd be out of business in the next two or three years. And so there, what I felt in my gut was actually in reality happening. And so uh, what I started to think about is why do we care about some products and services and not about others and the com- either the companies that make them and or the products. And there were the usual ones, um, but there were also like Coca-Cola and American Express and things like that. But there were also, there was a, a coffee company that was sweeping the nation at that time called Starbucks and they weren't doing any advertising. And remember my perspective at the time was in advertising from advertising. Uh, from an advertising point of view, and they weren't advertising, and Google was was had just started to become popular. They had just been created, uh, maybe two years old or something, and uh, and they were not advertising. Uh, there was no YouTube or Twitter or anything like that yet, and or Facebook, and the um, so there would always be this, and I talk about this in the book a little bit, but there would always be this uncomfortable moment when you're presenting a campaign. And you'd gone all the way up through the hierarchy of the company, the advertiser, and you'd finally be with the CEO or president. And they'd say, well, Google and Starbucks don't advertise and they seem to be doing very well. (laughs) They're on fire. Uh, Why should we be spending $30 million uh, on this advertising project campaign? And there'd be an uncomfortable silence in the room and someone would pull something from the air and, you know, we'd move on and you'd, you'd run the advertising but um, they had a point and there was something there that was outside of advertising that was going on certainly at Starbucks and Google and people were talking at that time about Nike tribes and the Apple cult and all that, but they didn't know how to create it for themselves other than by imitating Apple and Nike and, and which is why I always point to why today uh, we still have Gatorade commercials that run that look like their 1990s Nike spots. Yes. And so the, um, and I've been saying that for 10 years, over, like well, it, almost 20 years now, right? <laughs> like they pulled that white label Mickey Mouse version yeah. of that ad and just put yeah. Caterade on it. And so, so I started to think about um, icons. I thought about the Nike swoosh and I thought about the, the cross and I thought about, um, you know, other things like that. And then I thought, well, they have icons and uh, they all have, seem to have a creation story. Uh, Nike, you know, started in a garage or in uh, Bill Bowerman's kitchen making the waffle sole with his wife's waffle iron. And uh, Apple started in a garage and 3M started as a, as a um, sandpaper company and IBM started as an office supplies company and you know and you just kind of go on from there HP started by the, the two guys Hewlett and Packard uh, winding coils you know so they had that and then they had all these other things they had a creed obviously think different and, and just do it and so forth they had icons rituals uh, that went with the icons they had a group of special words ice grande skinny decaf latte uh, they had people who didn't want to go there, non-believers, pagans, I called them at first. And um, um, for all the Starbucks that are out there, there are still people going to Tim Horton or Dunkin' Donuts or these days, you know, um, Stumptown or Blue Bottle or some other place that they prefer. And, uh, and then there's a leader. And so once you wrap all those things together, you, have, you develop to what today we call a strategic brand narrative which came from one of the books, which is nomenclature that came from one someone who read the book. And um, you pull that together and you construct, create, you build what uh, today we feel is a unifying theory that um, is really a level above social media, digital media, uh, and traditional advertising and experiences and um, helps drive the content that goes into those. You know, I think where it started to click with me, Patrick, was when I started thinking of icons. And right now we think of, like you said, the Nike swoosh or um, Ralph Lauren or or all these logos that yeah. were 
we just accept and and know. But when you think if this is something that is applicable 4,000 years ago, that icon would have been some image that identified a tribe. And when you're out with your tribe and you run into another tribe, you knew they weren't from your tribe by the way they were dressed or something iconic about them. And you either knew you were in danger or you knew that this was a tribe you could trade or conduct commerce with. Friend or foe. Yeah. And, and immediately that started to click with me and that imagine you're in that forest and you see a tribe around a fire and what you, you didn't just march into camp. You hung out on the per- perimeter and observed until you knew you were safe or you weren't. Yep. And what you're talking about with these pieces of code, the same thing is going on when we're observing brands and discerning whether we want to be associated with that brand. And the brands that have picked up these little pieces of the pieces of code and dusted them off and made them obvious, then it makes it easy for us to discern whether we want to be a part of that or don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. The part that resonates with me as you go through that description is when you're standing outside the campfire, you're waiting, you stand there and wait until you are welcomed in. And when, if you are inside the circle already around the campfire, if someone comes in without waiting <laughs> or without, uh, or just comes flying in there, everyone's uncomfortable. Messed up. Yeah. Uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the, you talk about the lexicon and it really clicked to me because let's say you go to a new church, maybe you're a Methodist and you go to a Baptist church. You don't know the lexicon. You don't know when to stand up. You don't know when you're an outsider. Well, you know, you're an outsider, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you feel it severely. (laughs) If you were a Baptist and you were in a different town and you went into a a Baptist church, you'd feel at home. Yeah. It's because of these pieces of the primal code that you're familiar with and that you know you can speak the lingo. You understand the icons. You know who started it. You know what they believe. You know what they don't believe. Yeah. And for sure, people who go to Comic-Con or Burning Man or even the Consumer Electronics Show, you know, for the first time, or a TED Talk for that matter, people know that you're kind of looking for someone to guide you. Oh, you haven't been here before? Here, let me help you out. You, you go over to here and sign up and get your badge and blah, 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 right? And so the, we have that same thing happening in stores all the time where people are unfamiliar with the store as they're walking through the mall, right? And they walk in and it either you know instantaneously if you're going to you're gonna like it or not. You feel in your gut, right? And if you're with someone else who, who's been there before, you know, they might guide you in. But if your gut says, get me out of here, you can't wait <laughs> yeah. until they're done in that store, right? Yeah. And so the, and that has to do with user experience. It has to do with preferences and all the cues and all that kind of thing. And when we talk about icons, I'd never really thought before about using all the senses as icons, which of course, was ridiculous because we always think about the logo and these days of the website, we do those things and our branding's done, right? But there are other, so many other cues that people have picked up on since I wrote the book. The first one being smell, which Abercrombie, you know, took <laughs> on a scale of one to 10, they took it to 11. Sight, sound, Abercrombie again, they uh, cranked the music up. Sight, sound, smell, taste, when you're talking about food and new products and food and so forth. And you're also thinking about uh, textures, which is touch uh, when you're thinking about food. Some people just don't like the texture of things, right? So crispy on the outside or crunchy on the outside and soft in the middle, et cetera. So all of these things come to bear when you're designing new products or you're designing new experiences and they're things that need to be thought through I mentioned this because I was talking recently with someone who's building a theme park in Texas. And I said, you know, there are all these cues here that you have to be cognizant of. And um, so we just talked about that. But yeah, I think the thing is, is about uh, going back to the campfire is that 
We think of these brands as being one of a time things, but we never think about the fact that as human beings, we are members of all these different communities, right? Whether you belong to church or you belong to a church community, you belong to a work community. If you play cards or gamble or something, you belong to that community. If you play sports, whether it's soccer or football or baseball, you belong to those communities, you know, winter sports and summer sports. If you knit or something like that, you know, you belong to that community. If you like music, there are all those different communities to belong to, hundreds of them, and all the favorite restaurants and places that you like to go, right? So we have all of these different communities. They all have their own creation story. They all have their own words that you have to use. If you used soccer words at a baseball game, you know, what would happen to you, right? It would be ridiculous. Yeah. So as human beings, we are hardwired to belong to communities. And as marketers or people trying to build communities, whether it's around a product or a place or around a movement or a concept, gravity or Bitcoin or something like that, all these pieces need to be filled in. And what you do as you fill them in is you ping both the rational and the emotional parts of our brain, which helps things to make sense for us. And if you make more sense than the person standing next to you, then you win. When I think about, I'm going to list off the seven pieces of the code here, but it started really to impact me. I got to attend the conference and they interviewed a series of people. And I started to recognize a pattern in their speech. And when you think about the seven pieces of the code, by the way, are the creation story, the creed, the creed are the, the belief system or the one statement that defines what they believe in, or really it's a declaration or a line in the sand. Rituals, what are the common experiences that surround that brand or that church or that team or whatever it may be. Of course, the icons, as we mentioned, these really concentrated images or or smells, or... Don't say concentrated smells. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, so I have a dog that has the one piece of primal code that we all yeah. laugh about here. Probably so do. But... That's funny. They have the sacred words. These are words that the insiders know that immediately identify you're an insider or immediately make you feel like an outsider. And then there are the non-believers, those that you sure don't want to be. And then the leader at the moment, the leader of the brand or the movement or the team or the coach or whatever that is. Yeah. So if you're able to string those together and and if you're able to tell someone, here's where this idea came from, here's what it's about, here's how we talk about it, here's how you use it, here's what it is, here's how it's shaped and what the color and and so forth. This is what it's not, never wants to become because in a lot of companies with brand architecture and so forth, you don't want to be stepping on someone else's area. And here's the team that's leading it. Well, I've just gone through all seven pieces of code and people who have been able to do that, just matter of factly, have been able to get their funding at big companies like Kraft, Johnson & Johnson, Levi's, and lots of others. And they're able to go in, you know, in these large corporations, they have hundreds of different projects going on. And the ones that get funded, if you're able to make more sense than the person, the people who were just before you and come after you, then you get your funding. And so that's one, been one of the happy side effects of all this, Steve. That is something that was totally unexpected. Not really, we didn't go after that, but I think that it's just a, um, a byproduct a happy byproduct of what happens when you construct your narrative like this. We're going to take a moment here so I can tell you about a book I believe you need to read. Most every day for the last 10 years, I've worked with business leaders such as you. And there's this common conversation that I've had over and over. And it goes a little like this. Steve, I see other brands excelling online and I feel we need to do the same because my customers are expecting it of us. I'm not sure where to start, but I think we need 
to redo our website. What's the best way to approach this? And this is why I wrote my book, The Golden Toilet. Stop flushing your marketing budget into your website and build a system that grows your business. It's a book designed to empower my business leaders so that they have the words and the proper expectations to communicate what it is they really need and get what they really need instead of something that's sold to them. It puts them in a position of confidence and clarity. And so to get this book, it's a great read. You can go to Amazon, get it there, or you can go to thegoldentoilet.com and click on get your copy. Now, back to our conversation. Yeah, you know, I noticed in these interviews I was mentioning before, they would have um, senators or they would have these owners of these big brands, famous brands. And invariably, at some point in the conversation, they would state a creed. They would couch it as, you know, we believe, and then they would say their creed. And then they would talk about, well, we honor our employees, and they would mention a ritual. And then, obviously, they had these iconic things that represented their culture and, and specific words. And it started to be obvious to me that the leaders that we follow and enjoy, they have these pieces either deliberately, well, deliberately, but also naturally. They just took the time to deliberately weave this in and to identify them and nail them on a wall, so to speak, and they started to repeat it. And that's the difference between clarity of a brand and a fuzziness of what a brand is. Yeah, I always call it the fog. Yeah, the fog. Yeah. 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 And, you know, it's a, it's a rhetorical uh, tool, really. Well, I experienced it. So, obviously, I wrote a book. We're talking about where I talk about you and your primal code in my book. But during the process of writing the book, I took this tornado of ideas that were swirling around in my head for years and started to get it all dumped out and started to become more succinct over time and become organized. And through that book, several of these things started to reveal themselves and it made it easier for my team to be more clued in to what we believe and why we believe what we do and why our perspective is unique and you know where the line in the sand is. It, it was really cool through that exercise. I've always wondered, what are some of the best ways that you've seen people that usually exist, but they're not obvious? What is the process that you take teams through to identify it, to help them like an archaeology, a, a dig? and identify these things, pick them up and dust them off? Well, yeah, they have to be interesting. The thing that uh, some people do is they, you know, once I lay this down for them, they go, okay, here's my creation story. I've got that. <laughs> and they say, here's my creation story. And they say, creed, and yes, here's what we believe in. And they kind of just spell it out for people. When people don't really care, you have to take these things. It's like the bones. It's the skeleton of the thing. And you have to flesh it out and make it interesting, you know, funny, sad, bring some human emotion to the thing and make it interesting in some way, which however you want to do it and whatever's appropriate for what you're doing. Right. And then it's not enough just to, because, you know, advise uh, a lot of YouTubers and it's not enough just to lay it down. Okay. I have it now and I've made this funny and I have icons and I appear on the screen in such and such a way and all this in a revolutionary war outfit or whatever it is, you then have to continually refresh those things so you don't get boring and dull. That's why things become boring and dull. And you move from being a fad to becoming, you know, a one-hit wonder, basically. In the world, we call it, in the music business, they call it a one-hit wonder. In the fashion business, it's a fad. And in real life, it's just um, you're dead in the water. You go away. That's why 80, 90% of new products fails because they either don't do this in the first place and fill in all the blanks. So people just don't understand where they're coming from and there's no story there. You were meaningless, started out being meaningless and you wound up being meaningless in the end. 
So the important thing is to keep them resonant. You have to keep switching them out and so forth. And so someone told me once that they have a chart on the wall with the seven pieces of code up there, and they just look at the wall and they go, oh, we talked about non-believers last week. Let's talk about our creation story this week. And that's what they do. And then they get on with, this is a quote, the other 36 things I have to do that day. And so that's important to know. And the other thing that's important to know is that some of this, when you read a good story, when you read a good book, when you see a good movie, you can pick out, you know, oh, here's where this, you know, Black Panther or any of them. Uh, You go through it and if you're looking for it, you can pick out the creation story and the creed and, and all of these things. And because they're all there, because those are the things that help make it relevant and resonate uh, for us as people, as, as an audience. And so we're just really just doing the same thing. Really what I've done is I've gone back and deconstructed brands, successful brands, powerful brands, to see what made them tick. And this is what I came out with. And uh, the important thing is that no one, while people will do, were doing this through gut instinct, hiring smart partners who also did it through gut and inst- great instinct and People had enough money to tide them through mistakes and so forth. But you automatically get, uh, you know, trust, vision, sense of values, resonance, relevance, and all the things that big companies spend millions or billions of dollars trying to keep going every year. And you can do it with zero money. We did a project with a um, conservancy in Africa who had zero budget. And all we did was tell their story the only thing that might have cost money was we created a new logo for them. A friend of ours helped us out with that and created the new logo pro bono. And we won in 2016 or 17, we won the um, gold award for African tourism. So against all the airlines, all the tourist bureaus, all the nations, all the hotel groups, et cetera, et cetera, this little conservancy in Kenya called Nabosho uh, won the gold award. That's cool. And all we did was use the was use the code. So the that doesn't mean that you don't need money um, because they certainly could have used money. <laughs> but the um, uh, we we all could have used money somewhere along the lane, way there. But the point is is that you don't need money to do that. But of course, the people with money, like the Amazons and Nikes and, and Apples of the world, uh, those companies are able to take this and they're able to hire really smart people to execute it, smart, talented people to execute it and, you know, do their Super Bowl spots or whatever they need, feel they need to do, their Instagram posts, et cetera, and create the buzzy, those buzzy little moments. And to get all those followers does take money because you have to push through the networks, as you know. So it seems like the writers of Game of Thrones, they sat down with your book and as they came up with each <laughs> I don't know if they did that, but I think they knew how to do it all on their own. But right. And yeah. so it's kind of a it's great a exercise. Yeah. 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 That exists there. But yeah, ex- Game of Thrones is one I throw up there as one of the uh it has all the pieces, right? Mm-hmm. So over the years, Patrick, has the appreciation for the insights in primal branding as it has it was it like a big splash in the beginning or is it like even more relevant now have you seen a shift in the way that brands are looking at or at expectations of marketing there has been a shift yeah and in the beginning well let's go today when i talk about community everyone goes yeah so <laughs> yeah and and i remember standing on uh, stage after stage after stage in uh, 2001 two three four five whatever and uh talking about brands or communities and people thought i was talking about either talking about church or minorities or movements or something or the neighborhood my local neighborhood they did not think of brands as being communities nor did they especially want to create one and the but that has changed you know, and now we t- kind of take them for granted and people go, what else do you have? So there has been that shift. And I think that that shift happened through, there's a great quote that Max Planck, the physicist had that I have kind of seized upon. And that is that great theories um, 
scientific theories don't take hold because you've finally convinced your peers that it's a great idea. All your peers, old peers die off and the next generation comes up and they go, well, of course that's the way it is. Yeah. <laughs> Just makes so much sense. And so that's kind of where I find myself right now. And the, um, it has had success, obviously, but I, it didn't have immediate success, I wouldn't say, although it did have some immediate success, but it was not like, it came out the same year as Blue Ocean, Blue Ocean Strategies, which was a huge hit. Primal has had more of a slow burn. And actually, when I spoke with Simon and Schuster about changing the cover last year, they said, well, you have a champagne problem. And there was static on the line, so I didn't really hear, couldn't hear champagne. And I said, I'm sorry, all I could hear was you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> static, static, static problem. And I went, I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you're saying. I thought I could, I just let them keep talking because I thought I'd be able to figure out what the problem was, but I couldn't. And so I said, I'm sorry, I, I heard I, there's a problem. What kind of problem do I have? And they said, again, you have a champagne problem. And then I'm going, what the hell is a champagne problem? And she said, well, you've been able to do what every writer tries to do, and that is keep the book alive for more than three to six months. And I went, oh, okay. I guess I can't afford champagne, but I'll, I'll go buy some. So yeah, it's been more of a slow burn, and uh, I'm grateful, actually, that I think it was better off not being a major hit in the beginning. There's a book by Ryan Holiday that's called The Perennial Seller, and it talks about brands or like Grateful Dead is one of the examples in there, but over time that these old hits actually sell way more than any of the new hits. And it's because of their perennial nature. That's what, why you're experiencing that is because your, your book is talking about a perennial concept that will never change. Yeah. What's been the most fulfilling opportunity that has revealed itself since you published this book? Going to Amarillo, Texas and having burgers. At the Golden Light. Yes. Now, folks, we didn't pay him to say that. He, that was extemporaneous. So. <laughs> <laughs> this was not rehearsed. No, it wasn't. That's a really hard question to answer. I mean, people always ask me, what's my favorite thing that I ever worked on? And uh, I always say my next project. <laughs> but I think that the, the one real life sort of thing that ha has happened is when I was in advertising, I, was, I had a good position and I was able to travel, you know, like to Denmark for Lego and around the world, basically. So I kind of thought to myself, when I started my own thing, I kind of thought, well, that's over now. <laughs> but I've traveled more. Thanks to Primal Branding, I've been on every continent except Antarctica. Worked on every continent except Antarctica. And one of our first clients was the Australian Wool Board. And then we went, you know, we've been around the world for a couple companies. And uh, yeah, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Beijing, Mumbai, Tokyo, Frankfurt, Paris, Moscow. Have you been banned in any of those visits or oh don't say that from returning uh, one of the first places we were invited to was china yeah we were invited to beijing the year of the olympics there so i don't know was that 2008 the year of the monkey we were invited there by baidu and huawei i knew who baidu was but they they were brand new they were a startup officially then but i did not know who huawei was and uh, of course now they're in the news all the time but that was fun. They were very nice to us. That's cool. So what's the future? What's going on? What are you excited about coming up next? We're trying to create, uh, we're working since last year, we've been working a little bit with Watson, Watson AI, uh, with IBM and uh, Watson. We want to push that forward. And because some of the tasks that take place no human being or even team of human beings can really do. So some of this can be replaced by artificial intelligence. So that's something working on. We're also, we've tried to do some private live events. You were at the first one and we did another one in Los Angeles and we're trying to do others around the country or world. 
Uh, I might be doing one in Dusseldorf coming up in a month or two. And then uh, going to the next thing. We were in Argentina last summer for a really terrific project for uh, high altitude wines that they make there called uh, Colomé and another one called Amalaya. And that was brilliant. So we get to go to some really exciting places and go, also going to speak in Africa at Johannesburg in uh, July. Quite the, the rock star. Well, Patrick, this has been excellent. Is there a question that I didn't ask that I should have? Oh, that's a great question. Also, we spoke at VidCon last year, last summer, and that's to YouTubers. So that was really special since my book is required reading by those guys. It was fun to um, be amongst them even for a little while. And yeah, I think the thing that we didn't cover is that we talk about products and services and we talked a little bit about movements, but it, the same thing happens when um, you're in placemaking you know, trying to design cities and so forth. We use the same construct for that. But people, places, and things, things tend to be products and services and people. It could be personality brands. A lot of people have started using it for that purpose in New York and LA, uh, people you've heard of, and that's been interesting. But you can also do it for yourself. Some people have mentioned that for example, uh, veterans coming back from the wars and so forth, they've used the same construct to help them redefine who they are and how they fit into the world because they're moving from one society or one culture, the military, and moving into the civilian world, and it, which is completely different. Different values, different, or I should say that the values that they held in the military are not, they're giving freedom of choice when they move back into the civilian world. So they're not told when to get up, what to wear, and so forth. And that's a problem. It's confusing, let me say that. It's confusing for a lot of people and to be hit all at once with this thing. And we talked about fuzzy brands earlier. There's literally something called, um, I think they call it the fog. And it lasts for about a year when you get out of the military. And if you have other issues because you were involved in something, you know, overseas or even here at home, though all those things coming together can be uh, debilitating. So, and it can also be used for um, anyone moving from one place to another because you're trying to move from one community into the next one. I'm reading this book. It's called Atomic Habits. And one thing that atomic, really atomic habits atomic habits yeah little habits little bitty powerful habits that help change but one of the things that really struck me was that by changing your how you see yourself by impacting your identity it helps you make a change or it helps you move towards that identity and so as i hear you talking about a veteran that's coming back their identity has been anchored on that military environment and now they're coming back to a, a different environment and their identity is doesn't matter anymore. Yes. And so by going through this, your this process is helping them start to identify this identity for this new time in their life. And that would help them become more stable or help them move towards a more healthy expectation of themselves. Well, it gives them tools and it buys them time, yeah, to help them work through it. That's great. Well, Patrick, this has been awesome. I'm really grateful for you to have this conversation with me. And hey, congratulations on the book. Before I forget, thank you so much. I so what? I agree. Yeah, I love it. What's one little piece of advice from this old wise author? to the young little little author that just published a book. I don't know. What do you want to tell me? Well, I'm <laughs> I think you're doing good, Patrick. I'd just stick to the course you're on. Don't listen to me. Well, there are two factoids that we use, metrics that we use, which you've heard before, but I'll repeat them for everyone listening. Edelman, which is a huge global PR company based out of Manhattan, they uh, came up with a study uh, that's claimed that in the United States anyway, people need to hear about you from five different places before 
They even can acknowledge that they think they heard of you. <laughs> so five different places. If you live in Singapore, it's 17 different places. So that, just for starters, that's why it's better to have money than not have money, right? So if they see you on Facebook, they see you on Instagram, that's two. Uh, they hear about you on uh, your streaming in the news or something like that. That's another one. They hear about you from a friend. Uh, and maybe they see you on the shelf or something. So that's five right there. And that's just to get, oh, I think I've heard of them or I think I saw them somewhere. So that's one metric. So you have to have the five. And then the other metric is from two sociologists in Wisconsin. Last year, they came up with a study that said it takes, that claimed it takes 100 hours to make a friend. So if you want to be not only noticed, the five things, but also be relevant and a part of people's lives, then you need 100 hours. So add up all your Facebook <laughs> views and your YouTube views and your Instagram and, and all of that, and as well as real life experience, and get 100 hours in there. I mean, if you own a restaurant or a bar or something and people are in there for you know 45 minutes, they need 99 more visits, right? Before they feel a friend. So unless something dramatic goes on. So what's that dramatic thing going to be? How are you going to keep them there? How are you going to, um, so how are you going to become their friend? And so the other thing is that in performance marketing, people are always going for the next sale and they're ignoring all the people who've already bought in to them and totally ignoring the fact, I think, that one of the things that has changed in recent years is that people opt in or they opt out. And it is so easy to opt out these days because there are so many hundreds of different kinds of things and so many distractions, it's so easy to opt out. So if someone has opted in and either visited you, your site or purchased you or experienced you in, in any way, it is incumbent upon you. It's your responsibility to treat them like gold and to get them to come back and say positive things about you because we all live or die on our reviews. It's more important to add an extra star than it is to have a Super Bowl spot. So those are some of the things that have changed and those are the things that we didn't talk about and those are the things that I think that even small businesses uh, need to be aware of. Uh, actually, we had in turn into small businesses. We had a plumber come to the house today, and um, that plumber had a GPS thing that told me where they were on the highway, just like Uber. I thought, well, that's remarkable. And they actually pinged me beforehand to say that he was on his way. That's remarkable. And that's compared and contrasted with the other <laughs> plumber who never got even got back to me never even called me back to make an appointment. So guess where I'm going next time? Yeah, the one without the concentrated smell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's, you made a perfect, you made a golden loop there. <laughs> so folks, Patrick Hanlon, it's required reading of everyone that reads it, not just you guys at YouTube. You guys need to read Primal Branding. And I encourage you to do it. You heard it from... Patrick himself. He's a good guy. Where can they find it? That you know where they can find it? They can find it on bookshelves everywhere. Amazon in particular is a great place. Where else, Patrick? Amazon. Kindle. You can get Kindle there. There's Kindle version. There's audio version there too. Thank you, my wise mentor. I've appreciated this time. It's valuable for me and for everyone listening. And um, stay in touch, Patrick. It was great to be here. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for listening to another fun episode of the ROI Online Podcast. For more, be sure to check out the show notes of this episode and feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn where we can chat and I can help direct you to the resources you're searching for. To learn more about how you can grow your business better, be sure to pick up your copy of my book, the Golden Toilet at surprise thegoldentoilet.com. I'm Steve Brown, and we'll see you next week on another fun episode of the ROI Online Podcast. Mm -hmm.